Yes. But good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and friends of our different yoga societies around the world, and welcome to another talk here uh, on behalf of Veda Life. We're live, and I'm in Mexico. My name is Maha Yogi, and I've been asked to give a little talk on Guru, the nature of Guru. What is a Guru? Why do we need one? Who is a Guru? Like that. Anyway. I'm looking at all these different technological things going on. I have my iPhone over here. There we are. I have my questions on my my iPhone. Here. So why do we need a guru? How important is he? And uh, is it possible to make progress without a guru? That's my first question to talk about. So I'm told that many of you practice yoga and you're thinking about getting involved with a guru and and you want to know what is that all about? My particular qualification is uh, I've been studying yoga, Vedanta, Bhakti yoga in particular since about 1976, formally. I was initiated formally by my guru, uh, His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada in 1976. But I did study before that. Uh, I found a copy of the Bhagavad Gita when I was about 15 years old. and I was very much interested in the sort of spiritual science that I discovered there. So later on, I went to Srila Prabhupada and I was accepted as his disciple. And uh, he was very old at the time, about 76. He passed on. And about five years later, in 1981, I went to India and sought out uh, His Divine Grace Bhakti Rakshak Sridhardev Goswami. And uh, together with a friend of mine, we published some books of his teachings. This is one of them. This was published in the 1980s. It's called Sri Guru and His Grace. And I'll just read a little bit from the back cover. Uh, he makes an interesting point. He says, to err is human. To err is inevitable for all, being not perfect. Still, no one wants to remain imperfect. There is an element within all of us, within every living human being, that tends toward perfection. If it were not so, we would feel no want at all. Our tendency towards perfection is certainly weak and limited. Otherwise, we could attain the goal at once. Our limited capacity and tendency for perfection makes room for the guide or guru. So this is a very powerful and interesting point. Uh, human society is distinct from animal society. Aristotle said that we human beings are rational animals, but really we're much more than animals. The human society sometimes feels like it's an animal society, but uh, we're very much different in a number of different senses. Uh, animals, as far as we know, have not developed language, for example. You can tell your, your cat or your dog uh, I'm thinking we could have cereal on Friday and those special croquetas that you like on Sunday. But the dog or the cat doesn't hear any kind of time sequence. They can't make a plan days in advance. They just hear food. So animals have an ability to communicate, but they don't have language like we humans do. They can't explore uh, ideas like the future or the past as profoundly, and certainly they don't have literature, culture. Uh, the cats did not invent the pyramids, but somehow human beings came to this point where we're capable of 
deeper, more penetrating intellectual thought than any animals. So we certainly have an animal nature, but uh, beyond that, the human soul is capable of climbing to spiritual heights, and this is not seen in the animals. Um, the guru is an educator. He's a mentor. So if you think about education and how it starts, uh, every child has a mother, and our mother teaches us language. Uh, our mother and father, they teach us to walk, and they teach us to talk, and give us basic survival skills. So we know that fire is bad, water is good to drink, but don't drown. Uh, later, we go to school. And we have formal teachers who really teach us language. If our mother taught us basic expressions, in school we learn to read and write. And we discover that there's a whole body of uh, literature, a whole world of thought waiting for us to absorb. And uh, in this way, it's the duty of each human generation to convey all the information from 50 or 100 generations behind us. Uh, to this generation. It's an incredible, uh, miraculous task, if you think about it, that we come into this world, we don't know what a hammer is, or a pencil, or a car, or a book. But in due course of time, we can use Google on the cell phone and discover any information that we want. So. In school, we have teachers, and our teachers are gurus. So if our first guru is our mother and our father, and then in school, we also find teachers, mentors. Uh, later, we become more involved with our friends and our peers. We thought our, our mother was Wonder Woman and our father was Superman, but we discovered that they're frail. They're fragile vessels, just as we are. And they're not really Superman. Uh, your father can't fly. And uh, we discover there is no Santa Claus. There's no magic kings. Uh, and we become disappointed and take shelter in our friends. So during our teenage years, we find that our friends become our gurus. They teach us what's cool, what's hot, and what's not. Our peers become our mentors. Uh, all this education prepares us for survival, uh, and beyond that, a little bit, prepares us for living. Uh, it's curious if you think about it that uh, dolphins, the moment they're born, they know how to swim. As soon as they emerge from their mother, their mother's womb, uh, they can fly through the water. It takes them about 30 seconds to get it. Um, the same with horses. Horses uh, take a couple of minutes to get their legs up and without their running. Human beings, on the other hand, r require two years of very careful nurturing before they can really begin to walk and talk. And after that, our education continues and continues into our teen years and, and beyond. But education is not really useful if its only purpose is to teach us how to uh, eat and sleep, how to mate and defend, uh, that may be adequate for the animals. But as I said before, humans are much more than uh, animals, much more than rational animals. In fact, we're spiritual animals. And uh, we're looking for something higher beyond the mere animal. So. In the Vedanta, this is called Atato Brahma Jigyasa, which means seek out spirit, seek out the spiritual nature within things. Find out what is eternal now that you have this human form of life. A lot of people discuss what the meaning of the word Atato is. It means now. So now that you have this human form of life, don't be an animal. Animals live on violence and sex. Don't live on sex and violence. That's not who you are. Or food. Sex, violence, and food. And 
than sleep. Uh, this is a waste of your time. According to the principles of subjective evolution, uh, a soul may pass through various different bodies uh, over the course of uh, reincarnation. So, if the soul is eternal, then the soul may go on and on in the cycle of birth and death before achieving the human form of life, the human body. The human form of life affords us a special vehicle by which we can seek out the higher truth. And that's what makes us uniquely human. So why not use the human form of life for something higher? But the problem is uh, there are many different distractions in our search for truth. And many of these distractions have to do with our survival. If you look at uh, Maslow's uh, pyramid of self-actualization, Abraham Maslow, he's a psychologist, he points out, you need food and shelter. You need a certain amount of security. You need a certain amount of love and emotional connection before you can expand into thinking about spiritual life. If you're worried about paying the rent, if you have an abusive uh, family involved in intoxication and uh, alcoholism, violent, abusive habits, it's very difficult to dedicate yourself to any sort of higher spiritual pursuit. So first you need to become a little bit uh, balanced, harmonized. Uh, there are many different challenges on the path to spiritual life, as many of you will know if you've tried to practice yoga. Uh, yoga gives us a particular sort of vision by which we can adjust ourselves within this world by understanding the nature of atma, dharma, uh, karma, uh, consciousness, brahman, paramatma, bhagavan, all these different ideas. But to master the spiritual process is not easy. So you need help, as Srila Sridhar Maharaj pointed out in this book. So to err is human. We're not perfect. And yet there's something within us that seeks perfection. Now, if you want to become perfect at something, you need a teacher. And this is true uh, across a wide variety of, of disciplines. For example, uh, if anybody can play happy birthday on the violin, but in order to play the Bach Chacon, you need an advanced teacher who will show you step by step how to develop the skills that you need to interpret such a masterpiece of music. And the teacher's guidance may be subtle. Also, you may need more than one teacher. You may begin with an elementary teacher who teaches you how to fret the instrument, how to tune it, how to bow the instrument. But that teacher may tell you at some point, this is all that I can do for you. I can't take you any further because my knowledge is limited. Go to a, a real master. And then you go to a virtuoso who will prepare you and tell you, okay, you're not ready for the Bach Chacon right now. You're not ready for Beethoven. You can play an easier composer. You can play exercises. Do it like this. Stand like this. Hold your instrument like that. And gradually you learn a discipline. And so the spiritual master is something like that. How does he know uh, what is the proper spiritual discipline for you? He learned it from his master. So then the next question becomes, who is a guru? Who is a proper spiritual master? And uh, then you have to think, well, he should be someone who's self-realized himself. So the Vedas tell us, Acharyavan Purusha Veda, 
uh, this is another interesting expression. Acharya is someone who teaches by example. So the true spiritual master, uh, he should be a, a sincere uh, truth seeker himself, not a charlatan, not someone who sets himself up as God or a sex guru or someone who's there to exploit you. Uh, just as any teacher takes great pride and happiness in seeing his own students develop, uh, just as that great violin virtuoso uh, is pleased to see his student play on the concert stage, a real guru is happy to see his disciple making uh, spiritual advancement. And he doesn't use his position uh, to exploit his student. This is uh, against the principles of uh, spiritual development. Uh, any teacher knows this. Uh, you need to keep a certain amount of distance personally from your students because they may develop such respect for you that they worship you as God. This brings us to a different point, and that is that in the Indian tradition, the Vedantic tradition, the spiritual master is seen as an extension of God. Uh, this is hard for Americans or Europeans to swallow sometimes because we think, no, I'm an individual. I bow to no man. Uh, I'm not going to surrender to anyone. But without surrendering to the guru, you cannot really achieve uh, his secret. You cannot develop to the point where you're transformed by his gift. You must surrender yourself to the guru. And this is very dangerous. People worry about that. Why, why should I surrender to this man? But in the Hindu tradition, the guru is seen as an extension of divinity. It's said in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the section uh, where uh, Krishna is instructing a friend of his, Uddhava, Acharya Mam Vijaniyan, Navamanyeta Karhichit, Namartya Budya Suyeta, Sarvadeva Mayo Guru. Uh, Krishna says, You should be the, the teacher, the spiritual master. He's me. There's no difference between me and the, and the teacher. And you should not disrespect or envy him, thinking him to be an ordinary person. He, he's a representative of all the gods. So this is kind of a sticking point, but it's something that you have to reflect on to resolve properly. The idea is that divinity comes through the guru, and you have to recognize that and take it where it comes. Um, It doesn't mean that guru is God in the sense that he can move heaven and earth, he can make it rain, he can rain down fire on his enemies, he can predict what horse is going to win the race. This is a mistaken idea. But it means that there's a certain divine current that flows through the guru. And if you surrender to the guru and accept that, uh, that current will transform your life. Um, this is seen in early childhood when we surrender to the instructions of our mother, our father, our teachers in order to learn. Uh, the greatest learning dysfunction is when you think you know everything and then you can't be taught. As long as I think I know everything, then I cannot be taught. I can't learn anything because I'm not open. I have no curiosity. So I have to surrender. I have to say, all right, uh, as Krishna uh, and Arjun on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, uh, Arjun looks out at the war field and he sees thousands of warriors armed against him. And they're all his family members and friends because it's a civil war. And he turns to Krishna and he says, I can't do this. Uh, what do I do? Help me. And uh, I accept you 
as my guru and my authority. Please instruct me. And the need that Arjun has within him is what sets up the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna speaks the Bhagavad Gita because he sees, okay, Arjuna is in a position now where he can hear this. So one of the most difficult things that we face, Srila Sridhar Maharaj used to call it increasing your negative tendency, uh, developing the kind of curiosity, the kind of uh, need that we're ready for instruction. This is true of any student anywhere in any educational system. Uh, I told the story the other day on my other talk of the uh, piano teacher and, and the $5 and $10 student. Uh, a student arrives to see the piano teacher and uh, he's just finishing up his lesson with uh, another student. And he turns to him and he says, that'll be $5. And the boy gives him $5 and goes. And the new student comes in and sits down. And the teacher asks him, do you have any experience? And he says, oh, yes, sure. I've been playing the piano for 10 years. I'm just here so that you can you know, fine tune what I already know. And the teacher says, oh, OK, uh, maybe I can help you. It's going to be ten dollars an hour, and the student says, "Well, now, wait a minute. You just you just collected five dollars from the student who came in before me. Why do I have to pay ten dollars?" And the teacher tells him, "Well, first I have to unteach you, and then I can teach you. So it's going to it's going to cost you double." So the problem is. If we come to the guru thinking, I know this. So many yoga students, they've, they've studied different forms of yoga, different schools. And they think, oh, I know this. I know atma, karma, dharma, yoga asanas, you know, pranayam, pratyahar, samadhi. I know all these terms. But uh, your knowledge is not really sufficient. You need help and guidance from someone who is really a deep spiritual adept. And in so many cases, people who give yoga classes are really interested in trying to make a living and pay the rent and teach you a few asanas to help the flexibility in your back. But they're not probing uh, the spiritual reality that can be afforded through a real understanding of yoga vision. They're not helping you to develop an understanding of reality. Uh, and this is a problem. Many people take yoga classes because they're thinking, I'm suffering in this world. I have a back pain. And if I take yoga, it'll help with my back pain. Or young women are thinking, this will make me more flexible, more beautiful, I'll be a better dancer, I'll have better sex, I'll, I'll be meet a better husband. But this is not the true purpose of yoga. The purpose of yoga is to take us to a higher space, a higher spiritual space. The word yoga, it, it's connected with the word yojana, yoga, yukta. It means to yoke, we're often told. And people say, okay, well, it means to yoke up with the divine, to yoke up with some, to connect with some higher spiritual reality. But it also has to do with a very simple idea. Uh, when you yoke two oxen together, you're going to travel a certain distance. So the yoking itself implies the path. So yoga also means the path. But the path towards what? Uh, the Vedas talk about four goals in human life. There's uh, Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. So Dharma means doing your duty. And Artha means material gain. Uh, Dharma, Artha, Kama is uh, 
desire, having your desires fulfilled, material desire, lust, sex even, and moksha. That's uh, liberation, dharma, artha, kama, moksha. You can see this as Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you do your dharma, you do your duty, you're working. Friday is artha, you get your pay. Saturday, kama, you go dancing and have nice sex life. And moksha is Sunday, you practice your religion. So dharma, artha, kama, moksha, these are sort of mundane concepts of human duty and religion. But beyond that, there's a higher life. And really, the purpose of yoga is to go for that higher life, to fulfill the purpose of human life beyond being a rational animal. And so you can think, well, I don't need a guru or a guide, I can do that without him. But if you try, you'll find that, uh, as the scriptures say, Tarko Patishta Shrutaya Vibhina Nasavrashir Yasyamatam Nabhinam Dharmasya Tatvam Nihitam Guhayam Mahajano Yenagatas Panta. Dry arguments are inconclusive. So you get involved in what's called Tarka, where you don't know. Who am I? It's a philosophical problem. Who am I? Is this world real? What is matter? And you can sit and talk with a physicist, a philosopher, a religionist, a theologist, and a yogi, and you'll get all these different kinds of answers. So the, the Shastra, the Vedas, this is from the, uh, the Bhagavatam, uh, tell us, Dry arguments are inconclusive. So you argue your point, I argue my point, and then somebody says, oh, both sides, both sides. Uh, let's split it down the middle. You say the sky is blue, I say the sky is green, and somebody says, well, let's split the difference, we'll call it red. But this is not truth. If I tell you the coronavirus is harmful, and you say, no, it isn't, and then I said, well, okay, let's split the difference. We'll compromise. Maybe it is and maybe it isn't. We don't get anywhere. So it says dry arguments are inconclusive. A great personality whose, difference, whose opinion doesn't differ from others isn't considered a great sage. Just by studying the Vedas, you can't come to the point. Shrutaya Vibhina. You may study the Shruti, but the Shruti has different points of view everywhere. Somewhere in the Shruti, it tells you uh, work hard and make money. Somewhere else, it tells you renounce the world. So the solid truth of religious principles is hidden in the heart of an unadulterated, self-realized person, right? Dharmasya tatvam nihitam guhayam. Guhayam means in the heart of a realized person. So mahajano yenagata sapanta. You have to look to those who are more developed than you. And these are saintly persons and uh, developed spiritual people. And see, well, what do they know, right? Maybe I can learn something. Maybe I don't know everything. And this leads us more closely into the heart of the argument. Well, then who is a guru, right? Rupa Goswami says, Vacho Vega Manasa Krodha Vega. Jiva Vega Mudara Pasta Vega, Etan Vega, Yoga Heta Dira, Sarvam Apimam Pritivim Sashishat. He says that a real guru is someone who can control Vacho Vega, the urge to speak, uh, and also the tongue. See, the tongue is very difficult to control because we like to eat and we like to speak, but the tongue is sort of the, the root of desire. And the tongue leads in a straight line. Udura apasta means the belly and the genitals. So you need to control the belly and the genitals, which means a guru is not someone who's on the lookout for sexual pleasure, especially from his disciples. Uh, unscrupulous gurus will say, well, a guru is God, so you must worship me as God. And uh, 
complete worship means complete surrender. So let's, you know, let's have sex. That's not the nature of a real guru, right? Rupa Goswami says a sober person who can tolerate the urge to speak, the mind's demands, the actions of anger, and the urges of the tongue, belly, and genitals is qualified to make di disciples all over the world. So it's interesting that he mentions Kroda here, which is anger, right? Anger means, I want revenge. I'm un I, I, I've been disrespected, and now I'm going to get you back. Anger, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Anger arises from frustrated desire. I want something. I can't have it. Now I'm angry. But a real sage, one of the qualifications of a real sage, a real guru, is an absence of anger. He may be angry at injustice from time to time, but normally he's free from anger. Now you may ask yourself, how do I become free from anger? And I'll give you a little exercise. I was told to speak for 40 minutes or 50 minutes, but here's a little exercise for you. Try to go th through the day without getting angry at anyone. See if you can do it. And if you can do it, you can buy a little calendar and put it on your wall or use your cell phone calendar. Mark a little green dot on that day. I went through the day, I didn't get angry at anyone. And then try to do it again tomorrow and see how long you can do that. See if you can do it for a few weeks. And then try not to get angry even mentally. So there's three levels of, of anger and violence, right? There's physical anger. Then there is verbal anger, where we express ourselves in a violent way to others, using bad language or abusing others. And then there's mental anger. So try to free yourself from these three things. See how far you can get, right? Anyways, a real guru does not have these sorts of negative qualities, right? What are the positive qualities of a guru? He's fixed in the truth. He's developed his spiritual knowledge through submission and surrender to his own guru through study and through practice. And uh, I'm running out of time here. So it's important for me to mention that this particular line that I'm involved with is called bhakti yoga. And the idea of bhakti is to try to develop a, a loving relationship with God. Now, God is infinite, but if he is infinite, that means he can appear to this world. He can make himself known. The perfect is not perfect if he cannot assert himself or help others. So the absolute appears in the form of the guru. He can deliver himself to us in the form of the guru. But the goal is not merely knowledge. The goal is to try to develop beyond faith to the position of of love of God. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, I'm sorry, the Bhagavatam, he says, Tasman Gurum Prapadyeta Jigyasu Shreya Uttamam Shabde Parechanishnatam Brahmani Upashamasrayam. So if you're seeking out the truth, try to find the truth in the form of a human who represents the Vedas, who knows the inner meaning of the Vedas, who's fixed in the absolute truth, an expert in the Shastra. Uh, just a very interesting book by an author named uh, Ray Bradbury. I used to read him when I was a kid. And uh, he wrote this good book called Fahrenheit 451, which is about censorship. It's about book burning. And the author said, well, really, it's about television, because with television and now the internet we don't read to you don't need to burn books anymore because people will stop reading them 
So there's no need to censor books if people simply stop reading the books. But one of the interesting conceits that he develops in the book is that now that books are being burned and they're disappearing, there's a secret society. And in the secret society, different people learn an entire book before it's burned and destroyed. And in this way, they inhabit the book and the, the book becomes them and they become the book. So the hero visits the secret society and he finds that there's a person there who is the Count of Monte Cristo. And they know the whole book from beginning to end and they can narrate it to you. Uh, the, the book itself has been destroyed and you can't find the Count of Monte Cristo in the library anyway. There's no more libraries. But there's a man who is the Count of Monte Cristo and he holds the book within him and he can give it to you. Uh, in the same form, someone else is Don Quixote and they know the whole story of Don Quixote and they can narrate it for you. Someone else is the Bible and someone else is Shakespeare. And in this way, they're preserving the literature because it's being destroyed and disappeared. Well, in our tradition, the important book is called the Bhagavatam, the Srimad Bhagavatam, because that book describes the nature of Bhagavan. You've heard the word Bhagavan. Bhagavan means personal God. Just like in, in Kiev, I'm told, there's a, or in Ukraine, there's a river there called the Bug. In Russian, the word Bog. It comes from Bhagavan, God. So the idea of the personal God is developed in a book called the Bhagavad. And in India, when someone has absorbed the teachings of that book completely, then they're called the Bhagavad. So the Bhagavad refers to the person Bhagavad and the book Bhagavad. The person Bhagavad represents the story of Krishna, the spirituality of divine love, and the science of bhakti yoga in, in a very personal way. So we're told to seek out that person who is the, the personal Bhagavad and try to take instruction uh, from them. I don't know if I answered all the questions. I, was, I think I, I, I just kept going on that one. Uh, how to know a real guru. How, we talked about that. Oh, to accept a guru, is it a one-time action or a constant transformation throughout life? That's a very good point. Uh, in my personal case, I took instruction from uh, Srila Prabhupada, who was the author of the... Bhagavad Gita translation that we studied in the 1960s. And then later, I took initiation from and studied under uh, Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Dev Goswami. And uh, when he passed away, his disciple Bhakti Sundar Govinda Maharaj was in charge of the Chaitanya Saraswat Mat there in India. And I did my best to follow him as far as possible, but it's not always easy to live in India, and my fortune took me here to Mexico. But I continue staying in contact with my spiritual friends and spiritual god brothers, because uh, Sangha is another important principle. There's Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra, but there's also Sangha. So Guru is your preceptor. Um, Let's say that you studied with a great master violinist of all time, and he taught you to play Bach and Beethoven, but now he's gone. So what do you do? You can listen to recordings, you can discuss with your contemporaries, and you can try to remember what he taught you. And so now, at the end of my life, uh, I'm in my 60s, uh, that's the position that I'm in. It's, it's more difficult for me to take instruction from a younger person just because of the the fact that I mentioned before. Uh, we think we know things and then it becomes more difficult for us to learn new things from younger people. But I'm always trying to uh, stay in the loop. So yeah, it's a question of constant tra transformation throughout life. It doesn't mean that you have to go and physically 
initiate yourself with a new guru every three or four years, but try to incorporate his teachings into your life as best you can. And it says, how will a person's life change after he meets a teacher? Well, different teachers give us different things. If we're open, if we surrender, and if we accept uh, and practice the teachings of a true spiritual mentor, uh, we should be able to progress along the path and realize ourselves as spiritual energies subject to a higher power. Uh, Ramanujacharya gives the example of the, the sun and the sunshine. Uh, it, it's not that it's all one and all spiritual energy is equal. There is the energetic or the purush, which is the origin of energy, God himself, Bhagavan. And then there's the individual shakti of that, the jiva souls, the atmas who emanate from the spiritual sky, if you like, the Brahma Jyoti. We're involved in this material world in a, a mystic way that's difficult to unravel. But as we develop spiritual knowledge, as we develop in devotion, we should be able to come more closely in contact with our own uh, inner nature and realize ourselves as eternal servants of, of Bhagavan, of Sri Krishna. So if life is a search for perfection, and if that perfection culminates not in spiritual knowledge, but in divine love, then uh, the guru should help us on the path uh, towards developing bhakti. Uh, first there's uh, shraddha, faith. Then sadhu sangha, uh, acceptance within the association of saints who help guide us. And that sangha culminates in uh, initiation by the guru doesn't really culminate there, it begins with initiation, that's why it's initial. Uh, initiation really sets you on the path, and as you develop, then you may find yourself uh, gradually increasing your faith to the point where it becomes bhava, and then prema, which is divine love. And I think that's all the time that we have. I, I was told 30, I think. I don't know if it's 30 or 40 minutes. But uh, I'd like to thank the people at uh, Veda Life for giving me a, a chance to speak. It's very strange trying to speak like this because I'm looking at a screen and a tiny picture of myself, but I can't see you. But uh, I know you're out there. And so I'd like to say hello to all the nice, wonderful people who are listening. And uh, we hope maybe you profited somehow from my reflection on the nature of guru. I am not in a position to be guru, but if you're sincere and look deeply within yourself and at the same time search, uh, the guru will make himself known to you and that will certainly help you on, on your path, I hope. And uh, so, big shout out to the folks at Fade Life. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Hare Bo, Gora Premanandi. And uh, unless there's any questions, that's kind of the end of my talk here. So, It's hard for me to know if anybody's out there. Well, I'm not getting cut off, so I can try to keep going for a couple more minutes. Now, sometimes people ask about different, um, different gurus. Everybody thinks then, after you've been initiated, you think, well, my guru is the only guru. He's the only one in the world. 
and he's the best. He's the Jagat Guru. And uh, one of the problems with this kind of mentality is that it leads to sectarianism. And uh, if a message is true and if it's universal, it must have more than one exponent. It, it can't be limited to only one spiritual guide. Uh, if the infinite is infinite, then he has infinite power to appear in as many avatars as he sees fit. So we see God himself coming as in the form of, of uh, Krishna, maybe Buddha, Jesus Christ, maybe the prophet Muhammad. Uh, every 500 years or so, there's a, a new avatar. There's a different avatar. In around 1500, there was the golden avatar, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who was God himself appearing as a guru, God himself appearing as his own servant. And uh, his message was, chant the holy name of Krishna. Because why? In these days, it's very difficult to create uh, a structure like a temple or even an ashram to bring people together. Uh, the easy way to do bhajan in this age is nam bhajan, which is to take the holy name. And so it's especially recommended to take the holy name of Krishna. And uh, I'll give you the mantra as it was given me. And this mantra is for everybody. It's very simple. It goes like this. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So it's symmetrical. It has two parts. One part is Hare Krishna, the next part is Hare Rama. So listen again. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. The second part. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So you can practice this mantra. You can find it online. There's lots of people who practice this. The idea is Hare represents the divine energy of Bhagavan Sri Krishna. And Krishna, well, it's Krishna himself. The divine energy of, of Krishna takes a fe female form, just like the yin-yang principle, or positive and negative in electricity. God has a positive side and a negative side. So, Hare is the negative side and Krishna is the positive side. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And you can practice this with the folks in Veda Life or there in Kiev or Donetsk, Moscow, or around the world. If you're listening to this internationally, we also have friends in London, New York, Los Angeles. I'm here in Mexico, in San Miguel de Allende. My name is Maha Yogi. And uh, we put up a little link on the right side of your screen, which is a link to my blog. It's uh, http colon double backslash mexpostfacto.com. No, at blogspot, I'm sorry at blogspot.com, that's it. Mexpostfact at blogspot.com. So you can check out my blog there. I've written about a thousand blog posts. The one that we posted there on the side has to do with the guru. It's from a book called the Gaudiya Kantahara, which was published in the time of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and give some really good advice about uh, Guru. For example, it says, Upaniya tu ya shishyam veda madhya payadvija sankalpam sarahasyam cha tamacharyam prakachute. An acharya is not one who only confers the sacred thread. He trains his disciples in sacrifice and teaches them the confidential meaning of the Vedas. Such a spiritual master is an acharya. 
or then again, Achinote, Yashastatam, Achare, Stapayatyapi, Svayam Acharate, Asmat, Acharya, Stenakirtita. This is from the Vayu Purana. It says, an Acharya is one who fully understands the conclusions of the revealed scriptures and whose behavior reflects his deep realization. He's a living example for he teaches the meaning of the scriptures both by word and deed. This is an important point. Uh, another word for guru is acharya. Achar means action. So someone who teaches through action is an acharya. And not everybody can do that. Some people understand the inner nature of the scripture. They have a very good idea of theory, but they may be weak in practice. Others may have very good practice. They follow all the rules and regulations perfectly, but they may not understand the inner meaning of the practice. But someone who understands both theory and practice is an acharya, which is a teaching guru. For example, uh, again, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, Kaviraj Das Goswami tells us, apane achare keha na kare prachar, prachar korena keho na korena char, achar prachar na mer koro, dui korya tumi sarva guru, tumi jagater archa. See, some, this is uh, from the Bengali of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, the Antyalila, where Kaviraj Goswami explained, some practice but do not preach. Others preach but do not practice. But one who is perfect both in preaching, precept, and practice is the guru of the entire universe. You are a real Jagad guru for you practice what you preach. Now, if it that you've accepted a, a guru and made lots of progress on the path, and then the guru disappears, you need to be able to find your guru uh, within the heart of others. So, then again, it said in the Bhagavatam, Naivo payanti apachitam kavayas tavesha brahma yushapi kutam ridha muda smaranta yontar bahis tanubritam ashubam vidum van Acharya Chaita Vapusha Svagatim Vyanakti. O my Lord, transcendental poets and experts in spiritual science cannot fully express their indebtedness to you. And he's talking about the Guru. Even if he had the lifetime of Brahma, for you appear in two features ex externally as the Acharya and internally as the Super Soul. Talking about Paramatma Bhagavan as the Guru to deliver the conditioned souls by revealing to them your devotional service and teaching them how to approach you on the path of pure love. So, then there's this lovely verse in Sanskrit that the devotees like, Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Unmilitam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha I was born in the darkest ignorance, but my spiritual master opened my eyes with a salve of transcendental knowledge. I offer my humble obeisances unto him. Then, of course, there's the, the song by Narutam Das Thakur, where he says, Shri Guru Charana Padma Kevala Bhakati Sadma Bandha Muisavadana Mate. He says, the lotus feet of the spiritual master are the only way we can attain pure devotional service. I bow down to his lotus feet with great awe and reverence. By his mercy, one can cross the ocean of material suffering and obtain the mercy of Krishna. My only wish is to have my consciousness purified by the words emanating from his lotus mouth. Attachment to his lotus feet is the perfection that fulfills all desires. He opens my darkened eyes and fills my heart with transcendental knowledge. He is my Lord, birth after birth. From him, ecstatic prema emanates. 
By him, ignorance is destroyed. The Vedic scriptures sing of his character. Our spiritual master is the ocean of mercy, the friend of the poor, Lord and master of the devotees. O oh, master, be merciful to me. Give me the shade of your lotus feet. Your fame is spread all over the three worlds. So I'd like to dedicate this talk to my spiritual master, Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Dev Goswami Maharaj, who taught me how to think and how to think deeply on these different matters. And I'd like to dedicate this talk also to my friend, Bhakti Bhimala Abhidut Maharaj, and uh, another great friend of mine, Bhakti Sudhir Goswami Maharaj, as well as uh, the devotees there in, in Kiev. So that was almost an hour. I can continue if we're still on the air, but I don't know if I'm still on the air. Well, Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, he, he develops this idea that the guru is non-different from God. So in a very broad sense, uh, whenever we can get a taste of divine knowledge from someone, that person can be considered as our teacher, as our guru. So if my guru, for example, he said with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Trinadapi Suniche Na Tararapi Suhishnuna Amanina Manadena Kirtaniya Sadahari. You're qualified to always vibrate the holy name of God when you're humble and tolerant. And you should be humble as a blade of grass and tolerant as a tree. And if you can realize that level of humility and tolerance, have no problem always remembering God. So, my what if I'm in a big hurry and I'm in a public place getting on a bus or in the supermarket and I'm in a hurry and pushing and pushing and someone turns around and says, hey, be humble. Be tolerant. I can think, wow, well, my guru is speaking through that man, through that woman. And in that case, in a sense, they're my guru. So you need to be prepared to see the guru everywhere, wherever he may appear, and to recognize, oh, this is the guru principle, because that principle is divine. So, Vishwana Chakravati Thakur, he says, Saksha Darit Vena Samastha Shastri Uktais Tata Bhavyata Eva Shadbi Kintu Praboya Priya Vitasya Vande Guru Shri Charanaravindam. He says that all the, sh all the Shastras, uh, Samastha Shastra Ukta, they all say that the Guru is Saksha Dari. He should be honored as much as Krishna himself because he's the dear most servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of such a spiritual master. So we should be prepared to see the spiritual master as divinity, even while we understand that he is a vessel, the, the divine message is passing through him. We need to respect the teacher where he appears. It doesn't mean that we confuse the teacher with God and that if God tells me to kill myself or kill someone else, we should do that. And this is very dangerous. And in the West, of course, the press and the media, they like to paint uh, gurus as uh, dangerous because you're giving up your independence and you're surrendering to someone else. But a real guru should teach you uh, how to interpret the Shastra for yourself, how to be a more perfect person yourself, not to simply become a clone or a robot 
or someone who's dependent absolutely on on the guru. That kind of a guru is not a real guru. It says uh, here in the Bhagavatam, we've got guru nasasyat svajano nasasyat pita nasasyat janani nasasyat daivam natatsyan napatish trasasyan namotya dhyat samupetam rityum someone who builds himself as a teacher but who cannot deliver his dependence from repeated birth and death, someone who can't save his family or his students should not become a guru, a relative, a father, mother, demigod, or even a husband. Under normal circumstances, one's own father and mother are worshipable, but in every species, one gets a father and a mother. It's much rarer to get the human form of life and guru and Krishna, because the spiritual master can bestow prema bhakti on those who have attained his mercy. So a real guru is, in a sense, he's the best father, he's the best mother, and he's the best friend. Hello? Is that, am I still being recorded here? I don't know. Am I still on? I might just be talking to an empty screen. Let me try to communicate. Hello? Are we, we're still on the air? Okay. <laughs> I'm told that we're still on the air. Okay. I've been asked to speak about Guru. So, then again, in the Vishnu Sriti, it says one who accepts disciples for personal service and fame is unfit to be a Guru. So, I don't want to mention names. Obviously, all of you who are listening may have had some knowledge or some connection with someone who was insidiously seduced by a bogus guru. But you can usually tell the bogus guru because he is using his position for name, fame, uh, fortune, uh, sexual politics. So it says here in the Vishnu Smriti, uh, Paricharya yasho lipsu shishad guru nahi, one who accepts disciples for personal service and fame is unfit to be a guru. And then again, in the uh, Purana Vakya, we have uh, Guravo bhava shanti shishya vita parahakaha, dul bha sad guru devi shishya santa paharakaha. Many gurus take advantage of their disciples and plunder them, exploit their disciples for sex, and use them to amass wealth. But a guru who can remove the miseries of his disciples is very rare. So if you find yourself in a situation like that, you might think, all right, what do you do if you get on the train and uh, you think it's the train for Moscow? And then after a few stations, you look and you think, wait a minute, I, I think I'm going south. I should be going north. Uh, and you check the names of the stations just to be sure. And then you, you ask somebody, am I going the right way? Is this trying to go to Moscow? And they go, no, no, this doesn't go to Moscow. This goes to Istanbul. Well, you can stay on the train forever or you can say, wait a minute, I'm going the wrong way. That's very difficult to admit that we're going the wrong way. But you can bite the bullet, as they say, and say, all right, I'm going the wrong way. I should turn around. You get off the train at the next stop, and you try to find another train that's going in the right direction. So. So there's an injunction here to abandon a bogus guru from the, this is the Udyoga Parva of the Mahabharata, 
where it says, Gurur Apyavaliptasya Karya Karyam Ajanata Utpatta Pratipanasya Tyago Vidyate. A guru who is addicted to sensual pleasure and polluted by vice, who is ignorant and has no power to discriminate between right and wrong, who is not a path of Shuddha Bhakti, must be abandoned. So, if the guru is abusing his disciples, then he should be left behind. Uh, another from the Hari Bhakti Vilas of, of uh, Sanatan Goswami. Snehad va lovato va api, yo griniyad dikshaya tasmin, guru sasajye ta devatas shapa apate. This is from Sanatan Goswami. He says, if a guru, d disrespecting the standard for giving diksha, gives the mantra to his disciple out of greed or mundane affection, he's cursed by the gods along with that disciple. One who assumes the dress and position of an acharya who speaks against the conclusions of Srimad Bhagavatam and other scriptures or performs kirtan opposed to the proper glorification of Sri Krishna certainly goes to hell for countless lifetimes along with his disciples and whoever else hears such non-devotional talk in kirtan. So there's all these different injunctions to avoid or give up the association of, of gurus who are exploitative. On the other hand, it's very dangerous for ordinary devotees to judge people. Uh, it's very easy to emit a judgment. We see somebody doing something and we think, well, that's ostrich. Right? Uh, someone is eating a tomato on a kadashi, and we know, well, tomatoes have seeds, and you're not supposed to eat seeds on a kadashi, so that man is going to hell. It's very difficult to make these kind of judgments, especially in Kali Yuga, which is an age of corruption. So instead of judging the corruption of others, we should be very careful to avoid. Uh, insulting those who preach the glories of Krishna consciousness uh, because we can contaminate our own consciousness that way and then we won't be able to take the, the holy name. Now some of you who are listening to me talk here, I'm just sort of droning on and on because I was told to do a, a 40 minute talk and now I'm giving a 50, I don't know, 60, 70 minute talk we're still on the air. But I'm reading these uh, quotes from uh, my blog. And, uh, my, I'm blogging at mexpostfact.blogspot.com. And now I'm reading to you a little bit from a book that was published during the lifetime of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur called the Gaudiya Kantahara. And uh, the first chapter in this is the uh, Guru Tattva, the Gaudiya Kantahara. It means the necklace of jewels worn at the throat of the Gaudiya Vaishnavas. So this line of Bhakti Yoga is the line of Gaudiya Vaishnavism that was especially promoted about 150 years ago by Bhakti Vinod Thakur and especially also by his disciple, uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and he published this book with the idea that uh, those who were following his line would have an easy scriptural reference to be able to uh, discuss different principles so uh, the first principle he mentions is that of uh, accepting a guru who comes in as a simply uh, succession. Tadvigan artam sagurum eva bigachet samit pani shrotriam brahmanishtam. The one who wants to know the absolute truth scientifically must approach a bona fide spiritual master and offer him everything required for sacrifice. Such a spiritual master must be fixed in the truth.
Then again, the absolute and relative position of the teacher is always confusing us. So when is it that the guru says something that is absolutely divine uh, and infallible? And when is he simply making uh, an observation? Uh, if the guru says, hmm, looks like rain, he's making an observation. He may not be uh, diving deep into reality to give the absolute understanding of uh, the nature of the weather. He may just be looking at the sky and thinking, hmm, it's kind of cloudy. Maybe it will rain. Uh, we must afford the guru this kind of latitude as well. If he says, the soul is eternal, I heard it from my guru, it's in the Shastra, believe it, it's real, then you can think, well, this is a divine instruction. If he says, you need to take out the garbage in the morning, then that's more of a local command. What happens 20 years later when the guru is not here and I'm living in a different country? And the garbage doesn't come in the morning. Do I still follow that order? So knowing how to adjust the order of the Guru is important also. Here's another quote from the Vedanta Sar. Janana Maranari Sangsarana La Santaptit Deepta Sar Jala Rashim Iva Upahara Panish Rotriam Brahmanishtam Gurum Upashvitya Tam Anusarati. So that Shrotriyam Brahmanishtam Guru, that, that means that the Guru is fixed up in spiritual science, Shrotriyam, by hearing. So it's just as a person whose head is of fire runs towards water, one burning from the fire of material existence of birth, death, old age, and disease, must run to a Guru for relief. So that gets back to... Uh, there's an interesting sermon called the Fire Sermon that was given by the Buddha. And we're not in the line of the Buddha, but Buddha, he's heavy. He said a lot of interesting things. So one of his famous sermons is called the Fire Sermon, where he says, uh, consider your position. You're on fire. Your eyes are on fire with uh, the beauty of this world. You're attracted to the objects of the senses. Your skin is on fire. You're attracted to uh, sexual pleasure, sensual pleasure, uh, feelings. Uh, but all these things are burning. You're burning in the material world. This, this world is going to burn up. Everything in it will burn up. Uh, right now there's a comet flashing across the sky. I don't know if you can see that in, in Moscow but it's burning through the sky. But the sun one day will burn up. The entire universe will burn up. Everything will burn up. It's temporal. So if the soul is eternal, what are you doing in this temporal world? Why are you so addicted to it? Why are you so absolutely attached to the objects of the senses that you let your eyes burn and your flesh burn you need to think about an exit plan. So here in the Vedanta Sar, it says, just as a person whose head is a fire runs towards water, one burning from the fire of material existence of birth, death, old age, and disease must run to a guru for relief. So you can't do it by yourself. You need help. You can't do it by yourself because you're an illusion and you're thinking, this is real. This world is real. Everything in it is real. I, I want more. I want more sense satisfaction. But the things of this world are only real because you think they're real. In a real sense, they're not real. If a tree, does a tree falling in the forest make a, a sound, as the old saw used by those who explore the concept of idealism that was fronted by Bishop Berkeley? Right? Does a tree falling in the forest make a sound if nobody hears it? Well, it, it begs the question, 
what about the other trees, right? Can plants hear? If a tree is surrounded by other trees, the trees can hear that tree fall in the forest. So take away the tree. If a tree falls in the desert, does it make a sound? Well, what if we visit that tree a thousand years later when the, the wood is rotted into dust and it was blown away by the scent? Uh, did the tree really ever exist? So what is existence? What is temporal existence? How do you know it's real? These questions, they seem very oh, academic. Uh, if I tell this to you in the light of day, but what about at night when your eyes are closed and you dream? Is that real? What is the nature of reality? Who can, who can guide us on the path of understanding what is true reality? If the soul is eternal, it means it transcends this temporal world, which in a very real sense can't exist because it disappears just like that tree in the dust in the desert. My body is not going to be here a thousand years from now. It won't be here 20 years from now, maybe. But what about the soul? So then you can say, well, I don't know if I believe in the soul. It's not a question of belief. Atma is real. Atma, in, in Indian philosophy, nobody debates the question of whether or not the soul is real. That's a, that's a Western problem. In Indian philosophy, it's taken to be self-evident. Everybody knows, I am, I am who I am, I'm here. Like Popeye the Sailor Man, I am who I am, that's all what I am, I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. I am. This is reality. You are. So why would you dispute that? Why would you spend years of your life writing books about whether you exist? This is foolishness. Right? Real philosophy begins with an understanding of the existence of the soul. And that's why Vedanta is such a, a big boulder in the road for anyone studying philosophy. The soul is a real thing. So, somebody who's fixed in spiritual knowledge, that's a guru, and they can explain, they can help you, they can lead you on the path. So, approaching a guru means going to him and surrendering and saying, you know what, I'm confused. I don't really understand all this. Help me. And the guru can adjust you. He can say, no, you're not ready yet. Don't come to me now really, this is not a good time for you. You're too much of a fool for me to use. Come back when you know something. Or he can say, oh, you know too much. Come back when you've forgotten what you know, and then I can help you. So, we've forgotten who we are. That's our real problem. In Christian philosophy, we're, we're made to believe that that we only have one life. You only have one choice, and that's this life. And if you don't choose properly, you, uh, the merciful God will send you to eternal hell. Well, that doesn't make any sense. If God is, exists, and if he's merciful, why would he send me to an eternal hell? What kind of mercy is that? There's no mercy there. How could I only have one life? If the soul is eternal, the soul is eternal. Then again, we're made to believe that because there was Adam and because there was Eve, they committed original sin by eating from the tree of knowledge. And as a consequence, everyone is born with original sin. That's an interesting thesis. I know it sounds silly, it sounds like mythology, but that's the mythology that forms the background of the Judeo-Christian ethic which governs so much of uh, Western moral ethic and then law. So even though it's hard to take seriously, Adam and Eve, the idea is there. And the, the concept is that we're all born with original sin. It means humans are innately evil. Man, woman is innately evil. We're born sinful. But this is not the idea of the Vedic principle or Atma Yoga, 
the idea there is the atma is real the soul is eternal the soul sometimes becomes covered over we don't like to call it the soul because it's a western term called it the jiva so the jiva is sometimes covered over right obscure just as light can become uh, obscured by dust so Kaviraj Goswami says, Krishna Nitya Dasa Jiva Taki Buligela Ve Doshi Maya Tara Galaya Bandila. The soul has forgotten that he is the eternal servant of Krishna. So Maya has obscured his internal knowledge and tempted him into this wilderness of ignorance. But being involved in ignorance and being sinful are two very different concepts. Karma is not the same concept as sin. There are universal truths, perennial wisdom, at the heart of every religion or theological system or yoga system. But karma and sin are very, very distinct concepts because karma is what the soul accumulates in his uh, trajectory in his sojourn in this material world. Uh, karma is what you do, but it doesn't mean that you're innately bad, as we're taught to believe in the, the Western world. So, Krishna Bhuli Se Jiva Anadi Bahimukha Atteva Mayatari Deya Samsara Vidukha. Forgetting Krishna, the soul is att attracted by the illusory energy since time immemorial which gives him innumerable miseries in the material world. So we're stuck in ignorance because of ego. Ego means I have this sense that I am. I am, I am the center of everything. I'm the center of the universe. And uh, the universe is for me. But this is illusion. And so the guru helps us overcome this. Right? Kaviraj Goswami uh, gives us this advice and then we're told in the uh, Prema Vivarta that we develop our situation in this material world through the subjective form of evolution. Consciousness creates matter. Consciousness develops material bodies which are distinct. Uh, Evolution is a strange word. It doesn't really mean anything. What we observe scientifically are, is a gradation of millions and millions and millions and millions of different life forms, all distinctly different. And some of them are a little bit the same. And so we class them as a species. But, uh, for example, dogs, uh, there's tall ones, skinny ones, fat ones, short ones, black ones, what they're all very, very different. But we, we give them this kind of classification because it's useful to us. We like to classify things. This is a dog, that's a bird, this is a fish. But to say that the fish evolved from a primitive aquatic life form or that the bird evolved from the fish, the fish doesn't get up and fly. There are innumerable gradations between a fish and a bird. So we call that evolution, but it's not something you can witness or observe. So how is that scientific? But what you can say is there are innumerable different kinds of consciousness and innumerable different kinds of life forms or bodies or species that house that consciousness. And so this is what's been ava made available to the different atma or jiva particles of consciousness in this world so being averse to the service of the supreme lord the living entity tries to satisfy his lusty desires for sense gratification and the illusory energy encases him or her within a particular life form they're given a particular kind of body and after many many different bodies uh, you may achieve the the human form of life, but we're all dancing under the spell of maya or the illusory energy, forgetting I'm the eternal servant of Krishna. And forgetting this, 
we become something like the slave of illusory energy. It's a kind of hypnosis or uh, hologram, if you like, that's provoked by our collective consciousness, uh, mass hypnosis. And sometimes we incarnate as a king, sometimes as a subject. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down. A Brahman, a Shudra, now an insignificant ant, sometimes happy, sometimes sad. We go to heaven, we go to hell. Sometimes we're a devil or a lord. And in this way, Brahmanda Brahmite Kona Bhagavan Jeev, Guru Krishna Prasade Pai Bhakti Lata Beach, Tate Krishna Bhaje Kore Guru Sevan, Maya Jale Chute Pai Krishna. In this way, wandering through the universe in different life forms, we may be fortunate enough to get the human form of life, and by the mercy of Krishna, a very lucky spirit soul comes in connection with a bona fide spiritual master. And by the mercy of that spiritual master, we get the bhakti lata bija, which means the seed of divine love and dedication. And if that seed is correctly planted in our heart and nourished with the, the water of the spiritual master, then we can become free from this illusory world of maya and return to a position at the lotus feet of the Lord. So, in the Bhavarta Deepika, the Mangala Stotram, we find Mukam Karati Bharchalam Pangum Langayate Girim Yatkripa Tamahungbande Paramananda Madhavam. As he can make a blind man see, he can make a lame man walk. I offer my respectful obeisances unto Lord Madhava, who is Paramananda, transcendental bliss personified, ecstasy personified the very avatar of ecstasy, because through the mercy that he gives us by granting us the spiritual master, the guru, a dumb man can speak eloquent words of poetry, a blind man can see the stars, and a lame man can cross over mountains. So, the Kata Upanishad tells us Shravanaya pibahu bir, yona la biashrin van to pibahavo na vidyu, ascharyo sya vakta kushlo se, labda ascharyo gyata kushubalan, kushala nushita. Many people cannot hear about the soul. So, in many different cultures, we're not interested in any sort of spiritual life. We're only interested in working, making money, having a good sex life, having children, family. The family is the most important. We love the family. We love our mommy and our daddy. And we work hard and get a house and then go into old age and our children care for us. And this is our idea of life and happiness. But we're not interested in the soul. We never hear about it. That describes many different cultures, but this is really barbarism. This is animal life. There's something higher than that, we're told, by India. So many people, they, they don't even hear about the soul. And, and then there are those who, they hear about the soul, but they think, well, this is all woo-woo. This is magical thinking. The soul doesn't exist. It can't exist. It's a fiction. There's, there's only matter. There's only physical uh, reality. Anything else is just uh, a lie, like Santa Claus or unicorns or the tooth fairy. Others... They hear about the soul and they, they, they don't have a guru. They can't go any further or any deeper. Maybe they have an intimation that the soul exists. 
it's very hard to find a guru who's a genuine seer of the truth. Uh, a qualified guru is a great soul and a rare gift. Only those who follow his teachings can realize the truth and become expert in the science of God. And such disciples also are very rare. Oh, I was thinking, you know, sometimes people say, well, how can you know if someone is a bona fide guru? Well, a very good way to know is look at his disciples, look at the students. Again, if we go back to the violin teacher, I like to use that example. Uh, you look at a violin teacher and you, you're not sure. Uh, he's old, maybe he doesn't play as quickly as he once did. And you think, ah, you know, I don't know, can he teach me uh, Beethoven? Can he teach me Bach? But you go to his disciples and you see, okay, play something for me. And wow, they can do it. They're, they're all virtuosos. You look at the disciples of uh, Joshua Heifetz, for example. Itzhak Perlman was a, a virtuoso disciple of his. Then you can begin to believe, all right, well, if the disciples are virtuosos, then the teacher must be pretty good. So if you're in doubt about a particular guru, take a look at his disciples and, and see, do they have the qualities that you're interested in acquiring? Do these disciples act uh, in a godly way? Do they seem to have realized anything? Or are they simply fools? Because if the, if the disciples are fools, then you're wasting your time. So, a genuine guru, he knows the truth about Krishna. He's surrendered to him and he's well versed in the Vedic literature. So, if you look at the disciples and you see, okay, they know the truth. They're surrendered and they're well versed in Vedic literature. Then you can understand, all right, then he, I can surrender here. I can learn something. If these people could learn, then I can learn. Tasmad gurum prapadyeta jigasu shreya uttamam shabde pare chanishnatam brahmani upashamashrayam. One who is searching for the ultimate truth must surrender to a guru who knows the inner meaning of the Vedas is fixed in the absolute truth and is expert in the Shastra. I don't know if I'm still on the air. I'm going to check. Oh, I got a message. Yes, we are. I think. I don't know. Hi. I've never done this before. Uh, it's strange. I can, I can do an interview and kind of know where I'm going by the reaction that I'm getting from the person on the other side, but just I'm just sort of talking into a, a screen right now. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to... Are we on? Here we go. Am I still on? I guess. Okay. So it's probably we have a short time already. If, if you want to finish, we can. Well, it's hard for me to talk and talk and talk. Hard, oh, Dandabhats to all the devotees from around the world. It's hard for me to just talk and talk like this without getting a reaction. Uh, because as a teacher, I like to see the faces of my, my students and I can sort of read their faces and then know if I've gone too far one way or another. But uh, here's another one I'll read you. We'll finish th with this one. It's, this, is, this is good. It says, uh, from the Bhagavatam. Yeah, it says, 
Yasya Sakshad Bhagavati Gana Deepa Pradeg Uro Martya Sadhi Shrutam Tasya Sarvam Kunjara Shojavat. The Guru is considered as the Supreme Lord himself because he gives the light of transcendental knowledge to his disciples. That's a very nice one. You can think of, I always think that for me, Srila Prabhupada was like the sun. He lit up the world. And then when he disappeared, uh, I felt like there was no light. I was plunged into darkness. And then uh, I discovered Srila Sridhar Maharaj. He was always there, but, you know, I was fortunate enough to meet him. And uh, for me, that was, it was like the moon. And when the moon is full, it's practically like sunlight, only it's cooler. And then when Srila Sridhar Maharaj disappeared, again, I was plunged into darkness, but I found new light with Govinda Maharaj, who was like starlight, which in a way is more beautiful. Uh, there's a nice... It's a nice quote from uh, Shakespeare that I have to, that's it. There's a nice quote from Shakespeare. It's about it's from Romeo and Juliet but you can use this when someone leaves this world and Shakespeare says when he when he shall die take him and cut him out in little stars and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun so the starlight that was given at the time of Govinda Maharaj, it was enough. It gave us all light. And now the sun has moved on, the, the moon is gone, and the starlight of Govinda Maharaj is no longer with us. But I like to think that as devotees, uh, we can each come together and maybe if we light a little match, you know, we can create or make little sparks, you know, we can create a big enough fire that we all get some heat and warmth and a bit of light from that. So I get light from all of you and I appreciate it so much that uh, I've been invited to talk a little bit here. And I'll conclude with this. It says the Guru is considered as the Supreme Lord himself because he gives the light of transcendental knowledge to his disciples. And consequently, for one, it maintains a material conception that the guru is an ordinary human being. Everything is frustrated. So, Krishna tells Arjuna, Tadvidi pranipatena pariprashnena sevya upadekshyanti te gyanam gyaninas tatvadarshinaha just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master. Surrender to him and inquire from him and render service at his lotus feet. The self-realized soul can impart knowledge unto you, for he has seen the truth. But we would also like to believe that uh, the guru can go beyond gyan to pure devotion. So, the Bhagavatam goes a step further and says, Evam Guru Pasanaika Bhaktya Vidya Kutarena Shitena Dira Vibrishya. With steady intelligence, you should develop unalloyed devotional service, bhakti, by careful worship of the spiritual master, and with a sharp axe of transcendental knowledge, you should cut off the subtle material covering of the soul. Upon realizing the Supreme Personality of Godhead through bhakti, then you should give up the acts of analytical knowledge. So we spoke a lot about how important it is to realize transcendental knowledge. But beyond that, 
were really interested in bhakti. And uh, I'd, I'd like to conclude there, if I might, because uh, it's very difficult for me in a way to keep speaking into a computer screen with the hope and faith that someone out there is listening. I certainly hope you are. So I will say, Amagana Timranda Syaga Anjana Shalakaya Chakshur Militam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Vancha Kalpaturubhya Sya Hipasindu Bhyeva Cha Patitanam Pavana Bhyo Vaishnava Bhyo Namo Namaha And I'd like to end.